So today we'll be talking about uh, containers and Kubernetes. Very interesting topic, obviously very close to my heart. Uh, we'll be diving into some of the concepts uh, and uh, it might look like a deep dive session, but uh, uh, I'll try to move from basics to kind of the deep dive ones. Uh, so a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sayam Bardak. I'm working as Director of Technical Evangelism at uh, CIVO. And you can find me on Twitter at that Sayam Bardak, where I tweet about uh, you know all my work, latest technologies, and so on and so forth. So please make sure you subscribe, uh, sorry, follow on Twitter uh, if you want to have any of those uh, conversations. And I'm very active over there. Uh, blogging, yeah, it's there. Like I'm a CNCF Portainer Traffic Ambassador. I'm a CK, CK, AD, CK certified. I also run a search magic show on Cloud Native TV, which is official Twitch channel of CNCF. Uh, some of the other channels uh, where I stream is sayambarak.com slash YouTube. Uh, I'm author of Let's Learn CK Scenario, which is based on Kubernetes uh, security certification uh, exam. And uh, I also recently started a channel in my native language, which is Hindi. So it is sayambarak.com slash cloudshala with my friend Kunal. So that's a bit about myself. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So we will be talking about containers. But obviously, when, uh, when whenever we talk about containers, uh, we obviously try to compare it or you know uh, try to uh, have a similar view in terms of virtual machines. So let's start by virtual machines and then move on to containers. So virtual machines are basically, in very simple terms, you have a physical machine. Now this can be your bare metal uh, or a machine in cloud, and uh, you have a hypervisor layer through which obviously you'll be able to create the virtual machines. Now, physical machine is having your CPU, RAM, disk, and network. So all these there, all these things are there in your physical machine. Obviously, you can think of your laptop as well as your physical machine. Because it's it's uh, actually, uh, you know, it is having the RAM, it's having the disk, it's having a CPU, so all these things are there. So you can consider your laptop also as a physical machine. Then you have a hypervisor layer over that, and you will be able to create the uh, VMs. Now, what are VMs? VMs are the virtual machines. You can call it as a, a slice of your physical hardware. So it's actually a slicing that is getting done. So a slice of physical CPU, slice of physical memory, uh, and it, it, will, it will take some part of the disk as well, and uh, it will share the network. So all these things are kind of slices. So VM is basically uh, virtualizes the physical hardware in two different virtual machines. Now these virtual machines can have a different operating system. So the need was basically to have, uh, you know, running multiple number of apps in different kind of environments. And uh, you can have like uh, uh, Ubuntu over here or, uh, you know, uh, any other um, uh, operating system over here. So you can, like this, you will be having multiple virtual machines, but this is the actual uh, slice of the physical hardware. So obviously when you talk about RAM and CPU and disk, they will be they having some finite value because they are not infinite, obviously. So obviously, the number of VMs that you can spin up on a uh, on a physical hardware can, will also be finite in number. So that's that's how the the VMs work. Now let's come to containers. So containers are basically the representation of an operating system. So uh, it it is exact. It is made to uh, feel you exactly like an operating system. So you can you'll be able to feel, look and feel like the operating system when you you know talk to containers. It will be having its own file system. It will be having its own memory address space, network space, user space. So all these things. So it is slice of operating system. So now what you have is you have a physical machine or a VM. You have a physical machine or a VM. On, obviously the VM will be having a particular operating system, and your operating system will be having a file system like, uh, you know, a slash etc slash root and all those things. And uh, it will be having a process tree, all the processes that runs, uh, a network uh, stack will be there, and the users that will be there. So same will be there in, uh, you know, uh, the same concepts are followed when, when it comes to containers. So when, when you inspect or when you go inside a container, it will be having you know, all the file system will be there, it will be having some memories, maybe uh, address space, then network, which is each zero, so you'll be having the root user. Uh, obviously, you can map it to the host user as a different user for, for some other purposes, but uh, like this, uh, it, it works. So, obviously, it, like here you, <coughs> here you need a hypervisor layer, here you need a 
container runtime. So we'll talk more about container runtime in the next uh, couple of um, uh, diagrams. So VMs virtualizes physical hardware. Container virtualizes the operating system. So containers will be kind of a very similar looking look and feel to the operating system. Let's move on. Now, here I go deep dive. Uh, so when we talk about containers, there are few concepts which are taken into consideration, be it any container runtime, which follows these to create a container. So these are Linux namespaces, control groups, and the union file system layers copy and write. Uh, most of your containers with adhere to, I mean, would be comprised of, you know, or will be made from uh, all these three building blocks. So basically Linux namespaces, kind of uh, uh, not very new concept, to be honest, obviously Docker itself is not a new concept now. Uh, so Linux namespaces were there and uh, using the power of Linux namespaces, control groups, and the layers with which you can uh, stack it on top of each other. Uh, there was something with which we can create a kind of stack that can represent a com container, which internally actually represents a, a complete operating system. So it, it can uh, slice down the operating system. So these are the namespaces. So the common, uh, the, the most, uh, I mean, these are the namespaces, so which are the process ID, so process ID for the container, and this is how it will look like in the container. So process ID uh, will map to like a PID one. Uh, if you are familiar with kind of Linux concept, you already know that. So PID one inside the container file system. Uh, each container also have a root file system. So this is this comes under the MNT uh, namespace. Then we have the network namespace. So each uh, container is having its own network interface, each zero that you might have heard if you have ever used containers. If not, then I'm telling you. Interprocess communication uh, process inside the container can you know share the memory communicate with other processes so that is the interprocess communication how it looks like in container then uh, Unix and uh, a time sharing system uh, UTS which is like every container is having its own kind of identity host name then uh, you have your uh, user so basically this is kind of not very straightforward mapping one to one. So you'll be having a root user for the container. So container will be having a root user, but it will it can be mapped to a different user in the host below. So this root over here will be mapped to a different user, can be mapped to a different user over uh, Linux. So like this, your containers are partitioned. Your containers are isolated from each other they will be having uh, using the concept of Linux namespaces and control groups. You might be having a question like what are control groups? So basically uh, a container also needs some amount of memory and CPU to run. Obviously it, it is running a process and a process would need a CPU and a memory to run. So all these resources and uh, you know, uh, the are, are can be controlled by the controlled groups, which are called C groups or um, it is basically just RAM, CPU, block IO, uh, all these things are getting you know uh, controlled by control groups and also it is grouping the resources layers and union file system so basically when uh, you run a container so you will be running so there is a concept of image image and a container so you write a code so all your code is packed inside an image then a running image is called container so that's how it is now in now when, when you talk about containers you can run multiple containers from a single image so like you say you have an nginx image and you can run container a from the same image container b from the same image container c from the same image container d from the same image but all these containers obviously like i told when a container is there they are isolated from each other and uh, if you change the HTML file of this Nginx image to hello and this to world, then they have to be separate. So basically, multiple writable layers. This is possible uh, using the uh, layered UFS system. So you have a unified view, shared stack, and each container has a writable layer. Although it is a single image which is shared, but 
on top of that every container will have its own writable layer to which it can write to uh, with respect to the changes that is made to that particular container so if any change is made to a container obviously the d will remain as it is it will not write into the d's layer it will write to the a layer so that's how the layering works now uh, obviously when, when we talk about isolation uh, it is not a perfect isolation it is not a absolute secure isolation uh, so obviously you you have seen like security vulnerabilities you have seen security scanning tools you have seen a lot of uh, 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 things happening in the security space so security wise there is a lot that you need to do obviously it is isolated uh, obviously like i told you um, if you write in container c1 it would won't go to c2 that uh, that sort of things the isolation the process isolation the network uh, linux namespace isolation all these things are there but uh, there are security uh, things which which you know like um, running as non root user uh, so prevent running uh, from non root user you can use the security capabilities which is called linux capabilities then you can have your security signing of the images then you can have uh, security at run time level uh, so all the security layers obviously you have to implement on top of your containers when you build the uh, complete production application so this is what containers is a uh, slice of operating system comprised of linux namespaces control groups and layer file system uh, these are the set of uh, you know uh, all the uh, set of namespaces it is comprised of Uh, PID, NET, MNT, IPC, UTC, user. You will be seeing this a lot if you search or Google out things. Now let's talk about the most famous one, which is Docker. Obviously, it was originated from Dot Cloud. Uh, Dot Cloud. Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, at that time, LXC was already there. So LXC is is like the Linux containers were already there at that point of time, uh, which were not as easy. to uh, set up a container because you you need to have you know all these knowledge and uh, lxc plus aufs uh, so dot cloud they created something lxc plus aufs with the help of so lxc was basically your network namespace and c groups which i just explained over here so this was lxc and this plus your uh, the file system you will uh, they they created something called dc i think if i'm not wrong dc uh after that it was you know it it uh, turned to docker now in docker also uh, they is slowly and slowly removed the dependency from lxc and they moved to lib container and uh, uh, i mean after that there are like oci initiatives which we'll just talk about so docker basically will be having a docker daemon so which has to be installed on operating system so first layer is os so obviously first is hardware your physical machine your os then you have a docker daemon then you have a docker client so basically you have uh, all the interactions that you will be doing is you will be doing through the docker client uh, all the management that happens is by the docker daemon or docker d which listens to the docker apis request and manage all the docker objects now docker objects are basically the image the containers and all those things so what will you what um, uh, basic things that you can do is like uh, docker pull nginx so you know uh, you can pull a image after pulling a image you can run a image so all these commands obviously i am not going through because it is like introduction to containers i want to explain the concept real well so uh, docker pull docker run now when you do a docker run it is a container next is build so you can build the container now obviously uh, uh, someone will be talking about docker files today so uh, you can write your docker files and uh, you can build using the same docker client docker build from this particular docker file and it will build out a image for you that you can run as a container now in that docker file obviously you will be uh, there is like you know you will be copying the source code or you will be putting some of the files over there so that is your source code so there is a source code uh, oh, you can build the image uh, and uh, you know uh, from the source code using docker file you will building the image and then you will pushing it to a registry so what is a registry so registry is kind of a central place where you have all the images like nginx ubuntu and all those things uh, so that is a registry centralized place for storing the uh, images there are multiple registries gcr docker uh, qa uh, github uh, uh, registry so a lot of registries are there where your images are there and each registry has its own uh, you know uh, kind of uh, 
uh, features uh, and uh, after uh, from there you can uh, you pull the image and uh, and you can push the image as well so you'll be building the image pushing the image then you'll be pulling the image and running the image so your code to build to push to registry to pull to run this is a kind of life cycle of running a container from your code so that's where docker comes in so it uh, you uh, everything uh, in the registry is the images that are getting stored now uh, when things were progressing obviously uh, there was an open uh, container initiative which is basically defining the standards because as of now there are multiple container run times all the container run times are uh, you know expected to adhere to these standards so like image spec standard and the runtime spec standard so basically how the uh, even docker only contributed to most of these aspects and uh, you know they they only started all this initiative so that uh, more and more folks can you know uh, have uh, you can have different container runtimes but uh, have a standard of that like have a standard of image have a standard of the runtime uh, so let's see how a docker container actually runs so whenever you type docker container run or docker run uh, what happens is it talks to the daemon it it passes the request to the daemon now the docker daemon doesn't know how to start a container so this is a uh, i think this is a rest call that goes to docker daemon it doesn't know uh, how to start a container it forwards the call to container d actually container d is a runtime which is which you might be familiar with if you are familiar with the kubernetes technology or kubernetes world but to be very honest container d also does not know how to actually run a container so container d uh, is obviously a wrong uh, long running process it manages the life cycle of a container like which container dies it contains there and all this stuff plenty of stuff but it forwards this request to run c so the actual component that starts the container is run c now run c starts the container it's a short lived process so run c will start the container and uh, this will, this is the this is the person uh, who is talking to linux namespaces and all that creating all your uh, pids and all those linux namespaces c groups uh, with the specific c group configuration that comes by default with the container runtime uh, so run c is the person who will be starting the container and then this process gets killed uh, now what happens like how how do the logs how how we can do you know see the docker logs or container d logs and all that stuff uh, and uh, uh, whenever the container exits or all that stuff how do we know about that we know about that from shim so shim uh, talks shim is a layer that that is between the container d and run c uh, container d and the container and this talks uh, to the container d and telling like uh, the logs exits and all that stuff run a uh, shim is also a long running process now for each container so let me make it clear like container d is one you won't have for every container you won't have a container d like you won't have different container d container d is a single process but for each container you will be having a separate shim for each container you will be having a separate shim process so that's how it actually works beneath and behind the scenes to the linux kernel level to the linux namespace level that is how it works so i hope uh, you get a good view of uh, you know till now what what a container is uh, you know what uh, how it is formed from linux namespaces and control groups you have an idea of how docker actually came into picture and you now also know how a container actually runs now when docker was there uh, docker was not only the not not only to create the image and push the image it also has a docker orchestration which is called docker swarm so it was in the orchestration space as well but that at that time there was rise of kubernetes which only focused on the orchestration piece orchestration of the containers uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, managing the set of containers how they will run how they will scale monitoring them auto heal auto scale all these features fancy features of the orchestration engine uh, and it was meant for scale rise arisen out of borg and omega projects at google born at google then they open sourced it donated to cncf then you know where the cncf ecosystem lies today uh, with uh, you know uh, n number of projects i say n number because nobody has time to count that so uh, that's how uh, the rise of kubernetes was there as of 1.20 uh, the kubernetes has deprecated docker means in kind of four or five releases i think uh, docker won't be shipped by default as a container runtime with kubernetes so that is getting deprecated 
uh, but I think Mirantis will be supporting that. So uh, that's a separate discussion. We'll not go into that. But now Kubernetes is there, and Kubernetes is the actual de facto standard for running the containers, for running your, uh, for orchestrating the containers and your applications. Docker is still very well there to run your containers. Obviously, even 1.20 people are not running in production. To be very honest, people are still running 1.16 versions, 1.17 in in their production in their any of the cloud vendors as well. So it very well uses Docker. So Docker is very well in place. But Docker internally also uses Container D. So even if you move to Container D, it's okay because Docker internally also uses Container D. Uh, so it is actually this particular piece is very lightweight. Uh, so obviously we need a lightweight solution with Kubernetes. That's why Kubernetes is a go for forward standard. I feel would be there uh, for uh, you know any application that would be getting started. Even to talk about any distributions like RKE2 uh, or uh, K3S, they all are or K0S, all are container D based because they know like it's very lightweight, it's very easy, and uh, you know uh, you directly can uh, do most of the things using container D. So I'll, I'll quickly touch upon the Kubernetes as well, Kubernetes architecture. So I told you like Kubernetes is an orchestration engine. This image is taken from the documentation. Uh, so Kubernetes is an orchestration engine and I will show you where Docker precisely sits over here or where the container runtime precisely sits over there and what is the use. So Kubernetes has a control plane and uh, um, uh, also has some nodes which are actual uh, nodes where your workloads run. So your control plane and the worker nodes uh, are there. So let's kind of uh, zoom in a bit and see. So your control plane is having few components. The major one is obviously is the API server. So API server, uh, API server is the kind of brain. And whenever you use, so like Docker, you have Docker client uh, for Kubernetes, you have kubectl. So kubectl is something that you'll be using to interact with the cluster. And uh, kubectl, whenever you type a kubectl command, it directly, the request directly goes to the API server. So API server is the one that uh, it, your request directly goes to. Now, as soon as the request comes to API server, like, hey, uh, okay, let me type kubectl run nginx and hyphen hyphen image is equal to nginx. So I, I told Kubernetes to run a pod, pod is the smallest unit in a Kubernetes. So I, I told to run basically an Nginx application uh, on the cluster. So what happens? How this request is processed? So it goes to API server, API server, uh, and and then it goes to scheduler. So uh, API server says, hey, there is a workload that I need to run, uh, which is Nginx image. Now scheduler, obviously, with its scheduling algorithms, uh, will see a lot of things. If you have defined any request resource things inside your yaml or specification uh, if the nodes present over here because scheduler has to schedule your workload in one of these nodes if your nodes has any dates uh, what would be the best fit node to run this workload so all these things you know and plenty of other things uh, scheduler will take care then scheduler will be assigning pick one of the nodes so let's say it picks uh, this particular node and say okay here is the node where you can run your workload so now the API server has the information that uh, your workload will be running on this particular node. All the information, uh, all the state of the cluster of the containers, everything gets stored in etcd. etcd is a key value data store for storing Kubernetes state. And it only talks to API server. You can see like that. So it only talks to API server. So everything is getting stored in etcd. Now, um, in a node, there is there are few components like kubelet and uh, kube proxy for the networking and uh, kubelet is the person who is directly keep on talking to api server hey api server is there anything that i need to run hey is there anything that i need to run okay now scheduler told run this particular pod on this particular node then api server tells yes there is one workload that you need to run run the nginx pod so kubelet says uh, okay i need to run nginx pod now kubelet has a component of cri csi and cni now this is basically the container runtime interface container storage interface container networking interface now the most important obviously is the container runtime interface on this particular node you will be having a container runtime either that can be docker uh, uh, cryo or container d uh, and so on and so forth uh, so uh, the kubelet will not run anything kubelet will just tell uh, hey uh, the container runtime if it's docker hey docker run this container and uh, you know when we tell docker to run the container what happens so this happens 
So container, then the Docker uh, talks to the registry, pulls the image, runs the container, and tells the kubelet I have run the container. Kubelet tells API server I have run the container. API server states store the states of a running container in etcd. That's how it works. So uh, there are other components like cloud controller, uh, sorry, cloud controller manager, which is basically for the cloud components like the load balancer and all those stuff. Get in talk to the cloud controller manager. And you have controller manager. So there are a lot of controller manager like replication controller manager, demon set controller manager, deployment controller manager, and so on. So if you create a deployment with replicas of five, means you want to create Nginx pod with always five replicas of it running, then it is a responsibility of deployment controller manager to always keep five copies of your pod running, of your container running in the nodes. Even if one pod goes down, it will automatically create another one. So that's the power. It automatically, uh, if, if for any reason your pod exits or your pod uh, you know, deletes, get, gets exited, uh, your controller deployment controller manager will create that. As simple as that. Uh, so you know all the components over here, you know all the networking pieces. Uh, so this is basically for the IP table setup for the networking node to node networking. If you create services, it will populate the IP tables and so on and so forth so that all the pods can communicate with each other, all the nodes can communicate with each other. So that's how the Kubernetes architecture works like. And uh, I hope you have a fair bit of idea by now what, what VMs are, where containers stand, uh, <coughs> where the containers stand. Uh, how a container is formed from Linux namespaces and control groups and layer of the file system, and how uh, uh, Docker came into the picture, how the open container initiative is there, and uh, uh, you know how actually a container runs uh, when when you run a Docker container run command. Then how it is how Kubernetes came into picture. What is Kubernetes? What its architecture? How if you run a command kubectl run pod uh, hyphen hyphen image nginx, what will happen? Where the request goes? Where everything happens? Which thing actually runs the container and it actually runs the pod? And where does the state gets to? That's pretty much it that I had from today's presentation. Uh, so uh, I hope you have some amount of knowledge on the containers. You know uh, containers. Kubernetes, how it works. Obviously, <clears throat> uh, this, there are some of the resources that I'll be sharing in the chat. HTTPS, uh, slash academy. Uh, so this is a Kubernetes course. So if you want to learn more about Kubernetes, uh, this is a Kubernetes course that uh, is created by myself. I, I originated that. Obviously, it has some of the other people uh, on my CMO team as well who have recorded some of the sections. Uh, so this course will uh, walk you through all the concepts of Kubernetes, how it works. I have worked really, you know, uh, in, in kind of deep in in the volumes, like how the Kubernetes volumes would actually work, and uh, you know, some of the core concepts over there with a lot of examples. So make sure you check it out. the The best part is is absolutely free. Uh, you need to sign up on co.com uh, no credit card is required to view this course so even if you if you sign up and uh, you are asked for a credit card that is only for creating resources on co not for viewing the academy viewing the academy is absolutely free for anyone so make sure you use this and uh, you know uh, learn kubernetes from me and yeah make sure you check out my youtube channel because that's where i keep on doing uh, tons of stream daily uh, so it's it's basically like Iamlarger.com slash YouTube. Uh, so uh, you can you can check out the YouTube channel. Obviously, it's it's uh, uh, have tons of resources. More than hundreds of videos are there on that, and uh, I keep on talking about the latest open source tech from the maintainers and the co-founders. So very interesting to see uh, and hear uh, from them always. Um, if you want to reach me out, please follow me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Shoot me out questions anytime. I might be late to reply, but I will reply. <laughs>